title is Toric Degenerations. And the exact Bohr Sommerfeld correspondence. Okay, and I'll obviously tell you what that's supposed to be about, but uh, it's joint with Alejandro Ribe, my colleague, and <clears throat> it goes back to earlier things with uh, Ribe, uh, Gilman, Eugene Lerman, who's here, and um, <clears throat> Swachin Wang. Okay. And so Basically, what I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> uh, Hamiltonian torus actions. So, <clears throat> let's say on a Kähler manifold. So, okay, and. <clears throat> What's going to be singular um, <clears throat> so this is going to be singular torus, uh, singular Hamiltonians. I'll uh, describe that in a second. And to jump to the uh, final conclusion, what's going to happen is that you'll have singular torus, singular Hamiltonians generating generically uh, a torus action and by degenerating the complex manifold in the sense of algebraic geometry you'll be able to acquire singularities in the underlying geometry of the, the, the base space of the system and the benefit from doing that is that the Hamiltonians will become regular and the, the uh, torus action becomes holomorphic. So <clears throat> That's, that's where that piece will come from. Now, the Bohr-Sommerfeld correspondence comes from geometric quantization. So the idea, the basic idea in physics, I mean, what Bohr-Sommerfeld correspondence is supposed to mean that there's some correspondence between the different ways that you could quantize a classical mechanical system. So <clears throat> this associating a quantum system to a classical system is usually not standard. The geometric quantization seeks to make, not with complete success, seeks to make a, uh, a canonical association. This can be done to a certain degree, but not, not completely satisfactorily. Any rate, <clears throat> but saying that you have two representations, what would quantization mean? It would mean you associate a finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, usually really, a Hilbert space to a mechanical system and then realize certain operators associated to classical observables, classical um, <clears throat> dynamical quantities. And the Bohr-Sommerfeld correspondence is supposed to say, well, even though we don't know exactly how to do this in a canonical fashion, there's not a, an algorithmic approach to this, you might have many answers. You might have many ways to do this. Um, the correspondence is, it claims, of course, that it's all one physics, and therefore there has to be a correspondence between the one Hilbert space and the other, which inter intertwines, if possible, the uh, dynamical operators and so on. So that's what the Bohr-Sommerfeld correspondence is supposed to be. So <clears throat> I want to relate those two. I'll come back later to what exact means. So <clears throat> I want to talk about geometric quantization to justify this. Okay, so we're going to have a manifold M. So for us, it's going to be compact. It's going to be symplectic. It'll have a symplectic form here. And eventually it's going to be 
Kaler. It's going to be complex. Okay. And we have L, uh, a line bundle. And we have a metric, a compatible connection, and the curvature of this is going, well, 1 over 2 pi i. Curvature of this is going to be equal to omega. Okay, so that's the usual geometric setup for the classical mechanical system. Okay? And the idea is to associate to all of this data some Hilbert space. And for us, this is going to be, from the point of view of physics, this is going to be a very simple model. These are going to be finite dimensional spaces. Okay? And <clears throat> the classical, the method proposed by uh, Kostin and others, Sniatitsky in, in um, I believe it's Calgary, is one of the main proponents, uh, <clears throat> is a canonical method of doing this. And the added thing that you need is a so-called polarization. Okay, which is going to be a foliation F, and it's going to be a foliation by Lagrangian submanifolds. Okay, and <clears throat> so what that means is that these the leaves are going to be half dimensional; they're going to be n dimensional, and the symplectic form restricts to be identically zero on each of the leaves. Now, <clears throat> of course, there'd be essentially no manifolds other than the torus that could verify this. And so you have to, <clears throat> a problem which will keep arising is the foliation is going to have to be singular. It's going to have to have degeneracies. <clears throat> okay. And so this is this would be what's called the real case. There's also a complex case, which is where F is going to be in the tangents of M, but now complex tangent vectors, and F would be equal to the sections local sections of this, okay? So that's in volume, closed under brackets, um, if the man, I'm assuming that's in volume. So I'm assuming that this is a complex structure on M. And <clears throat> the idea is supposed to be that H should be equal to the space of sections of L such that nab look C sections S, let's say, of L such that this is identically zero for any vector field tangent to the foliation. Okay? <clears throat> so for example, for example, over here in the complex case, this is going to be break up into two parts like so, and d double prime is just going to be d bar on our L, and so in this case, it's easy to say what H is, it's just holomorphic sections of our bundle L, be finite dimensional. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are times there are times, as sort of alluded to before, there are times when you have both a complex structure, so one of these complex polarizations, and a real polarization. For example, if you have a toric variety, the orbits of the um, maximal dimensional torus are going to be Lagrangian, and they will give you one of these foliations. But just as uh, 
in any torque variety like that. You'll have orbits of different dimensions. Those will wind up being the, in this interpretation, they will be the singular leaves. Okay? Now, <clears throat> so the Bohr Sommerfeld correspondence. says if you have, for example, two of these foliations and two Hilbert spaces, then these two should be equal. They should correspond one to another. And you can ask for more or less correspondence. As I said, there would be uh, operators represented on the Hilbert space, and you could ask that this intertwine the dynamical operators. <clears throat> now, somebody who um, wrote some very interesting preprints on the archive about this kind of thing several years ago uh, was the late Andre Turin. <clears throat> And he broke this up into a bunch of cases. He said, well, first of all, you could say numerical bohr sommerfeld equivalence. That simply meant that the dimension of the one was equal to the dimension of the other. Well, that doesn't tell you too much. You know, if the dimensions are finite and the same, then there's some isomorphism. That doesn't tell you too much what it does. And then exact means there exists a linear operator B from H1 to H2 intertwining uh, dynamical variables, dynamical operators. Okay, so I'll give you a so that's what we're trying to establish. And there are some easy cases. Um, anyway, before I get there, so, <clears throat> well, I have to explain something else first. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's look at the example first. So the example <clears throat> is going to be so this is going to be a toric Kähler manifold. So with this quantization condition, the symplectic form is the first churn class of the first churn form of the uh, line bundle L. Here we have H2. As I said, these are just the holomorphic sections. That's a finite dimensional vector space. We have a pretty good idea of what that looks like in some sense. And so what is the, what is the real case here? Well, the example I'd like to discuss, as I said, was let's say that we have uh, uh, a toric variety, a toric manifold M. And so we have a torus acts on M, and it's generated by Hamiltonians, H1, let's say, to Hn, and is half the dimension. Okay? As I said, then we'll take F, or F1, to be the orbits of Tn and M2n. Generically, that's going to give you a nice smooth foliation. The, the, the leaves will be n-dimensional tori, Lagrangian. But as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> whenever we have fixed points, so we'll have degenerate uh, lower dimensional uh, orbits. Okay. Now, what is the... What does this prescription tell you that I'm erasing so I can tell you anything I want? 
Okay. Um, well, so you've got something like this. These are the, the tori. Okay. And <clears throat> this maps by the uh, moment map, so-called, so just maps like this, to um, some polytope in Rn. And the generic points are the uh, fibers over the uh, generic leaves are of this foliation will be the fibers of the points in the interior of this polytope. Okay. <clears throat> and now, so what you see is that omega restricted to a leaf, I'll call it Roman F, so identically zero, says that the connection on this line bundle of, of restricted to a, one of these fibers has curvature equal to zero. So it's a flat connection. Okay. So that says, if you like, it's nothing more than uh, the Poincaré lemma. So it says in any neighborhood generically, there are lots of solutions of the equation this equals zero, where C is tangent to the foliation. just means it has to be constant in these directions. So the fact that the curvature is zero says you can produce as many of those as you could functions. Okay. Now, so the curvature is equal to zero, but the holonomy is not equal to the identity. Okay? So it means on the torus, you have a, generically, you'll have a representation uh, from this into the circle which will tell you the holonomy around the various loops in the, in the tori, okay? And now, it turns out, you have a certain freedom, not an awful lot, but you have a certain freedom for choosing these Hamiltonians. Now, the fact that omega is a, is a first churn class is an integrality condition, a so-called pre-quantization condition. So, without loss of generality, we can assume the following. We can assume that <clears throat> mu, the moment map, applied to m is equal to this polytope delta, which is a so-called Delzant polytope. M's, m is uh, non-singular here. It's a Delzant polytope. Non-generic in a very is generic in a very strong sense, and the vertices of this polytope are going to be integers. I have integer values. Okay, and in fact. This is, this is the real case. Right. Huh? Ah, H1 is supposed to be global sections such that, actually I'm rewriting something. It's just the same equation, it's just that you use different vector fields. Use the vector fields tangent to this thing here. Okay. But you see what, what I need to recall here. Yeah. What I need to recall here is that <clears throat> so you have M, let's say this is M1 to Mn, and let's say T. modulo Zn is in the torus, okay? Then, rho 
of F, let's say, applied to M1 to Mn, okay? So I'm trying to figure out what the monodromy is here, okay? Uh, so this will correspond to a loop which will go M1 times around the first circle, M2 around the second circle, and so on. Okay? And it turns out that this is e to the 2 pi i of um, <coughs> M1, H1 of F, plus Mn, Hn of F. So I say H1, H2 of F because, in fact, on the F, the the various Hamiltonians are constants. So there's a value associated to the fiber. Okay. okay, so what it says is that rho of F is the identity in this normalization if and only if, uh, sorry, this is, um, right, if and only if HI of F is in Z for all I. Okay? So these are the... So in other words, you said delta Z is equal to this. The bohr sommerfeld levels equal mu inverse of delta z, okay? Now, notice if you look at the inverse image of an integer point, as I said, you have this thing is equal to the monodromy is the identity and what that says is we have a unique uh, <clears throat> flat section. So this section which verifies that the covariant derivative is zero. You start at one point and you, you continue by analytic continuation. And the monodromy being trivial says that it comes back consistent. Okay. Now, if you, on the other hand, if you look at this picture over here again, well, we said locally all the fibers were the same. They had very many sections satisfying this constancy condition. But you see what's going to happen is this is discrete now, and for all values close to this integer value down in, in delta, the nearby values here, when you come around by closed loops, some loop will be inconsistent. There won't be a globally defined section, okay? So what it says is that <clears throat> global sections uh, of L satisfying delta C of S equal to zero are simply isomorphic to these. Are these sections of all of the leaves? Yeah, yeah. So they're distributional sections. They can't exist any place else because they can't satisfy the holonomy condition. Okay, so, <clears throat> so these guys are, of course, very distinct from the holomorphic guys, which are regular and so on. They're supported on these levels. And this is, of course, this is very much like the original ad hoc interpretations of quantum mechanics, that you basically went around and you tried to set um, physical variables equal to discrete levels, discrete values suggested by the mechanics. Okay, so here these Hamiltonians are 
the maximal number of commuting Hamiltonians, which you could observe quantum mechanically simultaneously, and you're specifying their values, each of them to have a value. Okay? And what it says is that the only time they can give you one of these sections, which verify the constancy in the direction of the polarization, is if you're at a so-called, at one of these integer points, and these are the so-called Bohr-Sommerfeld levels. Okay? And these we'll call the Bohr-Sommerfeld sections. It's unique up to a constant. Okay? Okay, so to answer Hoyle's question, that's H1. Okay. Now, in this case, it's known that numerical Bohr Sommerfeld holds. So that's the statement that the number of these lattice points in the moment polytope is exactly equal to the dimension of the space of holomorphic sections. So dimension over the complexes And now, there's a guess. <clears throat> there's a guess for the exact bohr sommerfeld correspondence here, which is you have smooth sections And these are contained in all the distributional sections of L. Okay? And so the question is, <clears throat> the question is, there's, uh, for example, for all of these guys, there's a Bergman kernel. Okay. Which is a canonical operator, comes naturally out of the data of the problem up to now. So the conjecture or the question is is this an isomorphism? Okay. Now, this was. In fact, Turin claimed that B is an isomorphism in general, more generally than what I'm describing here, uh, using uh, asymptotic analysis. Borthwick, David Borthwick, Thierry Pohl, and again, Alejandro Uribe. And what they were doing was to try to justify um, old ideas of the physicists. And so what you do is you introduce a parameter in, and you replace the line bundle by this, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the spaces that you're mapping out of, is, is it the sections that are constant along the leaves? Yes, in here, well, I can do this, because I can do this for anything. Because the way it's written, one, one is finite dimension, the other one is infinite dimension. Of course. But what I'm saying is that we have this. I'm lost about the 
Um, sorry. So in other words, this, this distributional space is big enough to contain both the holomorphic guys and these Bohr-Sommerfeld sections. And the claim is that you can project back onto the holomorphic things, and then these guys will go exactly to that. And so the idea was to basically, um, you should think of 1 over n being Planck's constant, and they're going to let n tend to plus infinity. And the idea would be that for each n, you'd get different moment maps that would be very simply related. And you would see more and more points showing up here as, as the n got larger, because now it would not be just integer points. It would be rational points with denominator n. Okay, And what they said was that if this is a Bohr-Sommerfeld level, then the Bohr-Sommerfeld section projects to something which peaks exponentially, like a Gaussian, uh, around the Bohr-Sommerfeld level. Okay? And similarly, you'd have another one over here. And so what you would see is that these guys should be linearly independent because their inner product should be basically the integral of this very small part from one, exponentially small, times a very exponentially small part times the other. Okay? That should go to zero. That does go to zero. Okay? However, what happens is that as each of these new points enters, I'm rescaling things. That's why we get denominators. But as you rescale things and you get new denominators, it is true that you can prove that the original sections are going to be independent. But what happens is that new sections are entering. And you cannot prove that they are independent of the original ones because they haven't peaked yet. So in other words, the sections will change with n. They'll be associated to the same Bohr-Sommerfeld level. But they don't start peaking around the Bohr-Sommerfeld level until Planck's constant is small or until the n is very high, very large. Okay? And so this uh, is not true as claimed. Um, and in fact, it's going to depend on phases of sections. Okay? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on orthogonality relations between different complex sections. OK, well, how does that work? OK. So, first remark, and <clears throat> this is with uh, Gilman and Uribe, it's a very simple remark, it is that <clears throat> exact or Sommerfeld is true for M toric. Okay. And the reason is because the proof is that in this case, we've got this Bergman projector, okay? And we have the operation here of the torus, which is holomorphic. And because it's holomorphic, it will commute with the Bergman projector. And we have an action over here. Okay. Now, in fact, the characters 
of Tn on S fm, so uh, fix an integer point <coughs> in this, turns out that this section is going to be preserved. It will be multiplied by a character of this group and by the equivariance property on the Bergman projector are the same. Okay? And in fact, they have multiplicity 1. Okay? So this count over the integer points here is basically the count over the character decomposition of the space of sections. Okay? So the only thing that has to be shown We only need to show that this thing's not identically zero. If it's not identically zero, you've proven that it's an isomorphism one dimension at a time. Okay, so we only need to show this. And basically what you do is you calculate this inner product. Okay? You show that that's not equal. And that's very simple. Are you using that you already know it's a numerical thing? No, in effect, this proves it again. <coughs> if you like the monodromy. The monodromy calculation is what shows you that the multiplicity is 1 and that that's what the character is. Okay. Okay, so this, I'm not going to... anymore. <clears throat> but here's a remark, and this is this is what enables us to do anything new here. The remark is that we could take uh, M to be X in some large projective space. So this could be a singular toric variety. where you have a bunch of Hamiltonians with the usual torus that operates on the projective space, and you restrict those Hamiltonians here, they generate, uh, in this case for some of them, they generate a torus that operates on this thing. So it's a toric variety in the sense of algebraic geometry. Okay. And it has usual Omega Fubini Studi restricted to X. L will be equal to the hyperplane bundle restricted to X. And <coughs> the above applies to X Omega Omega is the Fubini Studi form, etc. Uh, without any real change, okay? So where you have um, the complex form, it's going to be this. And once again, um, H1 is going to be equal to this. Now, these things, again, might be uh, more complicated. Maybe some of these special or Sommerfeld levels are going to be um, 
realized on singular points, of course. So here's, here's the simplest example. <clears throat> so we take, uh, let's say, Q2. So this is in, oops, okay, so this depends on a parameter t. When t is e not equal to zero, that's a non-singular quadric. When t is equal to zero, it becomes a cone, okay? So the variety collapses to a cone. This here, what I'm drawing here, is a real two-sphere. For example, if the T is real, then this has a complex conjugation. And this might be, uh, well, if I want to do it that way, I have to write it as something like this, x1 squared is x2 squared, something like this. Okay. And this, this is going to be... Uh, a Lagrangian surface inside this two-sphere, inside this quadric, is a symplectic manifold, and it gener degenerates or disappears at that point. That's the so-called Lefschetz vanishing cycle. Okay. So, on this variety, if you <coughs> if you calculate what the moment polytope is on Q zero. What you find is that it has, if we arrange the, label the variables suitably, it's going to be a polytope, it's just a triangle, it looks like this. And the usual Delzant condition, if you look, you see here, first of all, there are four dots, there are four integer points, those correspond to the four homogeneous sections on P3. And, but what you notice here is that at the origin, you take the basis along these, the uh, edges that come out of the origin, and you get the determinant of 1, 1, and 1 minus 1 is minus 2. And the Delzant condition would be that this determinant has to be plus or minus 1. So this is, this cannot be uh, realized as some holomorphic uh, torus action on some Kähler manifold. It can only be on this, this singular variety. Okay, so the question is, what is a system here? The basic idea is to look for a system here which degenerates to that one, okay? And what we want to prove is that the exact Bohr-Sommerfeld correspondence is going to hold for the singular system by a perturbation result from the exact poor Sommerfeld correspondence on this variety. Okay? So, now where do you get, where do you get such a system? So here's a geometric example of a singular toric system and QT T not equal to zero. Okay, well in other words it's just the quadrant. Well it turns out um, it's given by what we could call truncated geodesic flow on S2. Okay. And this, this basically is, is a kind of Grauer tube construction. There are going to be several people who will talk about uh, that construction later. I won't say too much now, but <clears throat> what it is is the following. So we, let's take S2 with the round metric, okay? And using that, We can look at the tangent bundle as the cotangent bundle. They're isomorphic canonically. And 
what I will do is I will look at T, this is a sub-level set, or S2, which is V such that the length in the round metric is less than or equal to R0. And then I'll look at a manifold. This is the so-called symplectic cut as introduced by Lerman. And, okay, so this is going to be T less than R0, S2, together with, uh, with proper gluing, uh, R equal to R0, so a sphere, maybe I should write it as a sphere, divided by S1. And S1 is the geodesic flow, which operates freely on the tangent bundle. Okay. Now it turns out, where does the Grauer tube business come into here? Our tube business comes in <coughs> uh, in the following way. This, it turns out, is equal to this complex quadrant. It's diffeomorphic to that complex quadrant. And this, it's more than this using the tube construction as a canonical way in which it is. Okay, and so what you get is on this cut, so let's call this um, <clears throat> m sub r naught, r, that's just the, the length function on tangent vectors, the Hamiltonian that that, that generates is going to be the geodesic flow. So this induces flow, well, on MR, Hamiltonian flow, and it commutes with, let's say, an S1 an isometry circle of the round sphere, okay? So what you see is that uh, H1 equal to R and H2 being the Hamiltonian of this thing, they have to commute, okay? And they generate a flow on this complex variety, but of course R has a Lipschitz singularity along the zero section. And it turns out, if you look at the moment map, if we normalize this so that R0, for example, is equal to 1, <clears throat> the moment map will just be this triangle that we saw before. Okay? Okay? And now, <clears throat> the point is, So the theorem is that exact bohr sommerfeld holds for QT, sorry, in the singular system for T small. In fact, this is true for more general varieties, but I can't make a final statement of the theorem. I'll just tell you why it should be true. Um, <clears throat> so the proof sketch, and I'll tell you what, the, what really limits the argument, the proof sketch is the following. It says, <clears throat> so you note that this thing is independent of T. 
So the space of global sections is constant. Therefore, there's a vector bundle, if you will. I mean, in this case, it's kind of obvious because they're all just sitting inside of P3. Okay. So these things are independent of T. And what that means is over, over a disk in T, I have something like this. I have this family overhead. The symplectic forms are varying nicely because they're all just restrictions of Fubini's 2D forms. Well, that tells us that L2 is going to vary nicely because the measure is just the second power of the Fubini's 2D form. Okay, so, the, so that the Hilbert spaces associated with this thing are going to be uh, nice and uh, smoothly varying. Okay, And so what you want to do is that <coughs> for each... Um, <clears throat> M, okay, and in this particular case, that just means each of those four guys, okay. What we have to do is we have to find that these projections of S, F, M, now as a function of T, are going to be independent <clears throat> by integrating finding the inner products in L2, in other words, against a basis of H0 QT of H. Now, this, this dependence here says you can choose that to depend smoothly. That's, again, trivial here because of the explicit representation in Q in the, in the P3. And <clears throat> so what it turns out is these are going to be inner products, basically because of the self-adjointness of the Bergman operator. It simply says you're going to look at uh, <clears throat> sections here, pair them with the canonical zero, trivial holonomy section, the Bohr-Sommerfeld section, then integrate them over the Bohr-Sommerfeld level, okay? So what it means is that we can have a matrix. Now here we do use the numerical Bohr-Sommerfeld uh, Bohr correspondence, okay? So we have a matrix which is going to be equal to the integral SFM against some section M prime, okay? And this is going to be a square matrix of the size, the dimension of that, okay? And the only thing that we have, the only thing that we need to observe is that, in fact, when, when we have T here, this is going to be a function of T, it'll be, these parts will be continuous in T, what, the only thing we need to know is that this, this family of distributions as a function of T is continuous in T in a weak sense, okay? Because then I let T go to zero. At zero, I simply evaluate the old argument, and we could choose the, we could normalize the bases in such a way that at the identity, this is the, at T equals zero, this is the identity matrix, okay? So this is going to wind up being non-singular for small t, which is exactly the statement of Bohr-Sommerfeld. So we get <coughs> matrix is non-singular. And this is exactly exact Bohr-Sommerfeld if these things converge, okay? And in fact, in fact, they will. Outside, I mean, in this simple example, it turns out that all the level sets will wind up converging 
And the only one where it'll be complicated will be here. This will be an S2, totally real S2, and it converges as a mass to the delta function here. Okay. So that's the one tricky thing that occurs in this example. Of course, in higher dimensional examples, many more things can happen. And we've only checked this uh, for degenerations of the quadric. It seems to be pretty generally true. There's work by Nishima, Ueda, and somebody else at Tohoku, I've forgotten, unfortunately, the other colleague's name, about such degenerations for the gelfon setland degeneration. So that's on the full flag manifold. That's a more complicated example. But we hope there's a, a theory of even a Delzon theory for these singular, singular varieties suitably interpreted. Thank you.